The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Hi. So, uh, Ruth and I work for Red Hat. Uh, we're in the Open Source and Standards Group, which is part of the CTO's office. And uh, we wrote a book called Raspberry Pi Hacks. Uh, we like Raspberry Pi. We had a lot of fun with it. We were uh, some of the first people to actually have the first revision of the Raspberry Pi hardware. And one of the things that we commonly uh, kept coming across was the fact that lots of people eventually had a Raspberry Pi but had no idea what to do with it, aside from either trying to get a whole bunch of them and make a cluster or uh, turn it into a media center. And so we decided that we would come up with a whole bunch of ideas on what you could do with a Raspberry Pi that were neither of those things. So to back up, how many of you have a Raspberry Pi and have done something with it that is not XBMC? Yeah, that's about average. Although it's, it's been steadily increasing. So we've been talking about the Pi for two-ish years now. And in the beginning, it was all like, I bought one on day one. It's been in my drawer ever since. And the number is steadily increasing. And uh, I think at PenguinCon, when we gave this talk, uh, almost everybody had built something really awesome. And I kind of just wanted to let the rest of the room give the talk. It was getting weird. Uh, but yeah, so I, I used to make that joke that everybody's was XPMC, and then we saw Evan Upton, who created it, give a keynote at LinuxCon, and he said the same thing, that there are about two million Raspberry Pis out there now, about a million of them are in somebody's drawer, and another half a million are XPMC, and then the last half, somebody's actually built something with it. They actually just hit the three million mark. Really? Yes. Good. So yeah, we'll get to that. Let's talk about the history of the Pi before we say all that. So uh, Evan was a chip architect at Broadcom. And, uh, and then was working at Cambridge University. And he realized that the students coming in were, let's say not the quality that the students of the past had been. And so kids who grew up in the 80s and even into the 90s were building their own computers and then had to program them to make them do anything at all. But then the kids who get to college now are like, I can open Firefox and go to a website. I'm practically a programmer. And so they were spending a lot of time in the beginning of their computer science education teaching them very basic stuff that kids used to come in with. <coughs> and so that was the entire inspiration for the Raspberry Pi, was to give them something to get in the hands of kids cheaply and younger so that they would get to college with a little more experience. So that's why it's called the Pi. The Pi is for Python, although obviously you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, the first run was for 10,000 boards, because they assumed that was all that they could ever possibly sell. And they sold 100,000 on the first day, crashed the websites of both sites that were selling them. And like you said, now we're at 3 million boards. So who knows what this is? Anybody? Who said it? What is it? BBC Micro. Bam, BBC Micro. This was the uh, source of inspiration for the Pi. The BBC Micro came out in December of 1981. And there was a Model A and a Model B, just like the Raspberry Pi is. It had a two megahertz processor, and you could choose 16 or 32K of RAM. Nobody's ever going to need that much RAM, ever. No, it's out of control. <laughs> and this is an ad for it. You can see it was intended for education. It was the whole concept, and this is what inspired him to create the Pi. And so there is the, the friendly neighborhood Pi and all the things that you get with it. Are you guys pretty familiar? Like most of you said you have one, so you know these basics, and we can get to the more fun parts of this. Uh, so what's the difference between that one and this one? Well, that's one of the differences, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so this is one of the newer boards. Uh, the easiest way to tell when you have about 4,000 of these now floating around your house and you can't remember how long it's been there and you don't want to have to plug it in and find out is the um, mounting hole, not mounting holes that are there and handy looking at you. That's how I can tell which one it is when I pull it out of a box. Or you can actually plug it in and do this. And so. Uh, the result, if you get 2 through 6, it's a Model B with 256 on the RAM. If it's 7 through 9, it's the Model A with 256. And then the letters D, E, and F are the uh, Model B with 512. So if you really do pull it out of the box and you're like, oh, no, what do I got here? This is how you can find out. And all these slides are online, so you don't have to scribble or take pictures or any of that wackiness. So I'll tell you where to find them. 
So now you, got, you get to go buy parts, because that's the best part. You get to go shopping and find things that, to build with. And so uh, a friend just asked me a couple of days ago, she wants to send a pie to uh, her nieces and nephews, and she wanted to know what should I send with it, because they're in China, and you would think that made it easier to get parts, but apparently wherever they are, it's much harder to get parts. She said, what should I send them? And I said, figure out what they're going to do with it and then buy parts. I think a lot of the kits, you can buy a lot of these beginning with pie kits, and what you get is an overpriced pie and a lot of LEDs. So figure out what you want to do, and then you can go shopping. Uh, Adafruit has all of the things in the world. It is a magical wonderland. It's what I wish Radio Shack was, so that I could just drive across the street and go into Radio Shack and buy all the things, but it is not. It is Adafruit, and it's online. SparkFun is getting a lot more Raspberry Pi stuff, and so if you want the tiny parts and little components, that's really handy. Uh, and then, you know, all these other sites. It kind of depends on what you want to build. So just start poking around, figure out what it is you want, what it is you need, and then you'll find the parts. And just never buy a Raspberry Pi on Amazon because they're $50 and it's unreasonable. <laughs> all right, so let's get started. The first thing that you need is uh, the right SD card. You should talk. Say some words. Words. Um, so, uh, so SD... That's only one word. Plural. So, uh... SD cards are generally crap, and they count on the fact that they're crap because they're cheap. They are cheap little pieces of flash memory uh, shoved inside a cheap little plastic case at the lowest possible bid. Whatever is cheaper tomorrow will be what is inside it tomorrow. They will not change the case. They will not change the revision. There is no way for you to tell what the difference is between the SD card that you bought at CVS and Walgreens. They're not the same. Even the packaging, the label, everything looks the same. So you're playing crapshoot with SD cards anyways. So the best thing you can do is look for a manufacturer that is less crap than the rest of them. And so there's a list on elinux.org. elinux.org is an embedded Linux uh, website, and they have a ton of high quality material about the Raspberry Pi there. But the most valuable thing we're talking about right now is this list of SD cards where people have said, I bought this SD card, it worked really well, or I bought this SD card and it burned my house down. So uh, <laughs> some of the faster. That would be a really bad SD card. <laughs> When SD cards go bad, they go really bad. You're going to get so much Reddit karma for that, too. Uh, so uh, there used to be a class 10 bug. There probably still is a class 10 bug, depending on the cards. Again, I did reference how crap they are. Um, so uh, some people have reported failures with using the micro SD cards with an adapter to get them to the full size. Uh, to be honest, that's all we ever use, and it's all everybody else sells as the part of the kits. So it works just fine. Don't worry about it. It's not the adapter's fault. It is the crap SD you put inside the adapter that's to blame. Um, and they will burn out over time. So uh, don't invest a ton of money in a super big, super expensive SD card only to be hurt when three months later it doesn't do anything. So if you Google pretty much any phrase that you need help with in Raspberry Pi, you're going to end up on this elinux.org site, which is a fantastic wiki full of all sorts of Raspberry Pi helpful information. And this particular one goes to their list of SD cards where people have reported, I tried the Kingston 16 gig class 6 card and it didn't work and here's why. And so you can actually go check and figure out if that's where your problem's coming from. Or, you know, be helpful and report as well. So display options. Um, so the Pi has two display outs. Uh, it has an analog composite video, which is the yellow port, and then it has HDMI. Um, it supports HDMI 1.3 and 1.4, which is pretty much all you would need. Some of the 1.5 stuff is, you know, for, you know, things like 4K TVs and whatnot, and obviously it's not going to support that because it didn't exist when it was built. Uh, it has a DSi connector for display out, but there's no actual supported displays right now. Uh, so you can't just take apart a phone or a tablet and then say, oh, the standard connector is here. Let me just shove it in the Pi and have things work. The firmware doesn't know how to drive out to those devices. The Raspberry Pi Foundation is working on a screen for the Raspberry Pi that the firmware will understand, but they haven't quite done that yet. Has been working for a long time. Yes. But they said that about the camera, too, and eventually the camera did show up. Uh, there's no VGA out on the Pi. So if you were hoping to use an old VGA monitor, you're going to be out of luck unless you buy some sort of converter. And there's plenty of Raspberry Pi sites that have converters to VGA from the various ports it supports. But I think monitors are boring and also big and heavy, and I don't like to carry them around. So fun alternatives. This project is worth reading the blog post, even if you don't have an old Kindle that you want to potentially destroy in an attempt to turn it into a monitor for your Raspberry Pi. What I love about it is this guy insults you as you're reading it. I mean, he says things like, you are probably too stupid to do this. And uh, if you don't understand the simple command line option, then I don't know why you're here. <laughs> it's great. It's worth just reading this. 
Uh, but he did, and he says you probably want to have two Kindles because you're going to destroy the first one and then figure out what you did wrong, and then you can do it on the second one. But uh, he got the old Kindle working as a screen, and now that I have a new Kindle, I might need to try doing this to my old one. Although I only have one, so I can only I don't get to screw up. The other option, is, uh, or one of many other fun options, is this thing. You know what this is? What is it? Yeah, this is the Motorola Atrix laptop. This was a $500 accessory for a phone about three years ago, and now it's 40 bucks on eBay. And uh, so if you're married to me, you get to give me $40 out-of-date technology for my birthday, and it's awesome. <laughs> and, and so basically, you have a Raspberry Pi laptop. It's got the screen. It's got the keyboard. You're good to go. The only trick with this is that it requires a unicorn of a connector that nobody in the world sells. The only way to get them, uh, the best way to get them is to just get on eBay and for $2 you get a giant pack of them and so then when you lose one you get to pull out another one. Uh, but you also, so it, it's a, a male HDMI to micro male HDMI connector is the unicorn we're looking for. And so we even, we needed one in California, we went to Fry's, I was promised that Fry's sold everything in the world and that was a lie. Uh, and so this guy in our talk was like, here, I have one. I've already <coughs> hollowed it out so it fits in the weird little connection. So this is super fun and easy, but you need the unicorn connector. When I uh, got my hands on the Pi, the first thing I thought was, well, let me put a touch screen on this and you know, build projects around that. And of course, I saw the DSi connector, and I thought, sweet, I can just take apart a tablet and put a DSi. But we already talked about how that doesn't actually work. So uh, the next thing we, we started to look at was to try and find something that would be USB connected, because the Pi has those USB ports. It makes sense to try to use them. And there's a, a fair amount of touch screens that are out there that are driven over USB. Unfortunately, all of them are display link. And what DisplayLink is, is DisplayLink is basically uh, a separate video card device to the, uh, the hardware. So it's not actually using the video on the board, the Raspberry Pi. It's actually driving it through something that's built into the screen itself. Uh, and a lot of the Linux distributions that are out there for the Raspberry Pi don't actually have support for DisplayLink devices compiled in. So for your convenience, these are the drivers that you would want if you were using one, specifically the MIMO 720. Whoa! Sounds working. <laughs> Told you it worked, sort of. <laughs> um, you now, Soundwave just wanted to jump in there. He had a point to make. Later, watch some Transformers music videos, which apparently is a thing. <laughs> internet full of them. Everything is a thing on the internet. It's kind of scary. <laughs> um, but uh, you have to turn these on. Now, the downside to this approach is that it works great once you get the kernel compiled and configured properly, but you're not going to get any acceleration out of the video because you're running on a very weak uh, graphics chipset that's running on the display link over USB. So it's going to be really, really dog slow for any sort of graphics operations. You're not going to get the video playback like we were just demoing inadvertently there. Uh, so, uh, and other systems like OpenELEC aren't going to work with it without rebuilding the kernel. Uh, RaspBMC is not going to work out of the box on one of those things. It won't work at all. Um, so the other option is to, uh, is to get a touchscreen device that isn't display link, that's actually you know dedicated USB connector and then has a proper HDMI connector to connect to the, uh, the main video out on the board. And this is a medium for touchscreen that we picked up on Amazon, which is handy if something goes wrong and the connections on the Raspberry <laughs> Pi are somewhere inside your costume. So building kernels. Uh, unfortunately, all of the code for the Raspberry Pi is not yet upstream. Some of it is, but uh, when we first wrote the talk, none of it was. Uh, so they have a GitHub fork of the Linux kernel that they keep reasonably current, and they track upstream kernel revisions pretty well. Uh, and then they make add their changes to it, add their specific drivers they need, the changes to the ARM uh, code base in order to support the architecture and the hardware. And there is a process to try and merge all of these back into the upstream. But for those of you who wanted to start and build your own kernel in the Raspberry Pi, you need to check out one of these branches from their GitHub. And the commands for doing that are on the screen. Um, the first command you would want to run is make Mr. Proper. Now, Ruth, go ahead. Who knows why it's called make Mr. Proper? This is, a, this is an interactive talk. You know? Why is it? Yeah, so Make Mr. Proper is a super duper version of Make Clean, because internationally, Mr. Clean is called Mr. Proper. <laughs> <laughs> so now you've, uh, you've got your SD card, you figured out what you're gonna do, now you need a distro for the job. As uh, Red Hat Fedora people, we have something of an inclination towards Pydora, it's what we tend to use in our projects. However, we also tell you that you should use the distro that is appropriate to what you are building. And so if you would like to use XBMC on your Pi, you should use RasBMC. That is one step, and you are done. <laughs> you should use that. That is what it's designed for. 
Uh, if you are a hardcore hardware tinkerer and you want to get into that, you should check out Occidentalis, which uh, is Adafruit's Raspbian-based distribution. They call it for education, but that's a lie. Like when you start reading the words, they say, if you don't know what you're doing, you shouldn't be using this distro. And I'm like, well, then maybe it's not for education, is it? Uh, and then there are many, many other options. And this is a teeny tiny fraction of the long, long list of distros that have been made for the Pi. And so if one of these doesn't suit you, you're welcome to go off and make your own distro, which occasionally somebody tells us they're going to do, and I don't know why. We, we mock those people endlessly. <laughs> <laughs> but of course we are thus obligated to tell you that Pydora is awesome and you should use it. And my favorite Pydora feature will always be uh, the as soon as I looked at the list, what I saw was that if you want to go headless and you never want to have to drag around a monitor, like my life involves figuring out ways not to take a monitor up and down the three stories in my house. And so if you always want to go headless, you add a little file to your SD card before you boot it up in the Pi, and Pydora will blink out the IP address through the LEDs and read it to you through a, the speakers in a delighted, playful British accent. It's very lovely. There is also an option called noobs, and so if, uh, if you are using it to teach a kid about Linux, or if you just want to screw around and see what comes up, noobs is a good place to start. It stands for new out-of-box software, and this is what you see when you boot up the Pi for the first time. And so you get to pick which distro you want to run, it does that, then you start typing some stuff, you've completely borked it, it's not working anymore. You hold down shift at boot, you get the menu again, and you get a do-over without having to flash your card again. Super handy. I got the slide. No. <laughs> yeah, that was a good summary. We can just move right on. No, uh, inevitably, sooner or later, we get to question and answer. Somebody goes, can I put Android on it? Yes, you can. It's a dumb idea. It runs really slowly. It's hard to compile. And you should just go to this Razdroid wiki page, download their ancient image, prove to yourself it's terrible and slow, and then never, ever do it again. <laughs> so now you need to get your distro onto your card. Whether or not you like Fedora, this is the easiest way in the world to do it. The Fedora ARM installer, you just click your SD card, click your distro, click do it, and it's done. You don't have to go to the command line. You don't have to do anything. Uh, but of course you can. You can go to the command line. If you're on a Mac, there's a little uh, option called RPI SD card builder. If you're on Windows, I don't know why you're here. So. <laughs> <laughs> or if you would like to skip everything that we just said, you just get on Adafruit and buy yourself a card preloaded with noobs and you're good to go. Then you skip the, the problems with SD cards and picking a distro, you just bought an SD card. If you're like me, you have a drawer full of them because every time you go on vacation, you're like, where'd my SD cards go? And you go buy three more for your camera. Power, tell All us right. about power. So uh, how many of you in here with a Raspberry Pi have seen it do something weird, something unexplained, like you start typing and it doesn't type and then the old oaks <laughs> give you that tiki like a hundred times. Power is why it did that. The Raspberry Pi wants five volts at one amps and no less, no more, you give it more or less, it starts to get unhappy. Now it has reasonable tolerances within range, it will continue to run, but things get weird. Now. The first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you have a clean 5 volt 1 amp feed coming into your Raspberry Pi. Now, most of us, hopefully, have Android phones and uh, have that micro USB connector for power charging. And maybe even you plugged it into your laptop and said, hey, I'm just going to run my Pi off of my laptop. And you said, hey, this seems to work. And then you get weird, random, odd behavior. Um, most likely because you're not getting clean uh, 5 volt 1 amp off of that cord. Uh, a lot of the phone chargers that are out there serve very well to charge your phone because your phone does not need 5 volts at 1 amp in order to charge its battery. It will happily trickle charge in a much longer window of time. But if you do give it 5 volts at 1 amps, it will charge a lot faster. But that would be more expensive. So why would they do that? They'll just throw the cheap plug in there and you're good to go. So if you want to have a reliable Raspberry Pi, go out to Adafruit or your favorite electronic site and find a 5 volt 1 amp power cord plug set up and you will automatically be in a better position. Now the second complexity about power on the Raspberry Pi is that the ports, the USB ports on the Raspberry Pi are low power USB ports. 95 to 99 percent of your devices that you have with USB connectors are high power USB devices. There's a difference in the standard and specification. So when you plug in a high power device to a port that's only providing low power, it will do the best that it can. And some of the high power devices can actually run at the low power standard. But what happens far more often is you go to plug your keyboard in with fancy features that you don't care about, but came with the keyboard anyways, because you can't just buy a simple keyboard anymore. It also has to make toast. Uh, or you plug in a Wi-Fi dongle. It will detect, the driver will load, and then the device will go, well, I'm done and stop working. 
Linux is like, hey, I loaded a device driver. I don't know why things aren't working. Everything looks good to me. And it's because of the power gap between the devices. The way to work around this is to put a powered USB hub between your device and the Pi so that you can guarantee that you have that high power. And by powered, I mean not you plugged it back into the Pi to feed power to it. <laughs> but rather that you, yes. Oh, that explains what But rather you've actually plugged it physically into the wall with a, with a brick. Um, so put a hub, put a power brick on your shopping list, do this before you start any sort of project and your life will be much, much, much happier. So these things, whatever, you guys don't need to watch that all day. No! This thing that charges your cell phone when you're at a conference and your phone dies in like two hours are super handy for your portable projects. But I have noticed that, uh, in fact, this is one of them. They started selling more and more of these with a one amp output and a two amp output. Don't have a sad day. Pay attention to which pole we're plugging things into. Yeah. The iPads and the Android tablets need the two amp. And so that's why they do that. <coughs> C6. Did we, did we mention C6? I don't think so. We should no. mention C6. If you look at your pot, yeah. I have a, has the situation been resolved with the power, with the uh, powered USB hubs that you have to be careful when you're models you get? Um, don't buy the cheapest ones from China that you possibly can, because sometimes they will back power and will run power back over, and there's no protection built in the Pi for it to be expecting power. Um, in fact, there are USB hubs that are built specifically for the Raspberry Pi. There's even one that's built with just the right amount of back power across it so that you can power it off the hub and not need a separate source. If you're really concerned about it, there actually is a hub designed for the Pi now. I think cleverly named like Pi Hub or something. There's several. Yeah. But yeah, so don't buy something that looks like it came in a freebie bin somewhere. I mean, anything you buy that has a name brand that you reasonably will recognize is not going to be a bad one. Uh, Belkin, Linksys, any USB hub from a vendor that doesn't appear to only exist in a website somewhere. So C6, if you've ever opened up your Pi, do we have another question? Yes, we did. Oh, sorry. What if you uh, wanted a solution where you were building a Raspberry Pi cluster and you wanted to power it like being five or more Raspberry Pis? Is there a solution to do that? Power strip and five bricks? I mean, Again, what you need is you need five volts at one amp running to each Pi across a micro USB connector. How you deliver that, you know what the, you, ha you have to start with a micro USB connector, but if you're clever and you want to wire all of those into a single power supply and then step down the power to each to those level on each one of those cords, I've seen people who have built clusters who have taken like a PC power supply and run it through circuit boards to step down the power to the just the right amount for the Pi so that they have one power supply that's powering a whole cluster. A lot of the websites that talk about doing clustered Raspberry Pi talk about how they have power supplies and a couple of those people are actually selling power supplies specifically for that purpose so that they have a one power supply that has a whole bunch of clean 5 volt 1 amp uh, micro USB cords coming off of it. Well, the Pi has no feelings, but but uh, but but uh, but but it will it will it will emit the magic smoke and refuse to work. It's pretty. It's yes. an option. I mean, it's a one-time show. It's kind of like when Daffy Duck says, "This is a great show, but only one time." Oh, sorry. Yeah, the question was, will it hurt the the Pi to put two amps in? And while the Pi has no feelings, there will be a one-time and one-time only performance of the magic smoke. Yeah, the Pi is tolerant within, uh, within 0.1 amps of, of the 1 amp recommended, so it will run for varying degrees of running at 0.9 and 1.1, but anything more than that, it will just go and die. So, your Raspberry Pi came with this really cool thumb holder right by the power. It's my favorite feature. Yeah, you just hold it down right there, and that's where you plug in, except then the first time you do that, that capacitor breaks off. And so when you need to replace it, this is what you will Google to solder back on, and the black stripe goes towards the outside. Your Pi will probably still run without it, but uh, should you decide that you would like that capacitor in your life, this is how you get it back. Now what your Pi does not have, despite its many cool features, is an on-off switch. This is a fixable problem. You solder two little header pins in, right behind the magic thumb holder, right there in those two little holes, you short them out, you have an on-off switch. So you want to you wanna test your voltage. Plug in all of your peripherals, all the stuff that you're going to use in your project. Set your multimeter to 20 volts. You touch the red one too. Can you guys see? Yeah, the little TP1 is labeled on this side. You're going to need your uh, old person glasses sometimes to see the labels on here. But touch your red lead to TP1 and the black one to TP2. And you need to be seeing 4.8. And if you're not seeing 4.8, you have found the problem with your setup. 
you, you really want to see five, but if you see 4.8, then you're yeah. in the ballpark at least. You, you at least know that, that that's not perhaps the biggest problem you have. You may have done something else wrong. You can also test, there used to be, I think, three polyfuses, but now they're down to one polyfuse on the back side of that little uh, TP2 label. And you can test that too, but instead of plugging in all your peripherals, take everything out and then touch one lead to TP2 and the other to F3, which is on the back, on the SD card side, and that'll tell you the voltage coming from the fuse. You switch to the other side, it tells you the voltage coming in. And so if you're having power problems, that's how you test and find out what's going on. They also gave you a handy dandy little strip of LEDs in a corner to tell you what's going wrong with your power problems usually or with uh, one of the files on your SD card. And so most of the cases have a handy dandy little hole here so that you can see what's going on with the LEDs. And if you're building your own case, you should probably leave yourself a way to see your LEDs and what's going on. Unless you know that you've done all the right things on your SD card and all your power is right and nothing bad is gonna happen and then I guess you can just paint right over them. You don't need them. I wanna meet those people that have that scenario. Nothing ever goes wrong with my projects. Ever. Ever, ever. And so this is what the lights will tell you. Uh, there are slightly different codes for the lights on the older Pi, so if that one's been sitting in your desk drawer for a really, really long time, if you go to that elinux.org site I talked about earlier, it will tell you what the lights mean for older uh, Pi's. GPIO, which is the my favorite part of the Pi, uh, is general purpose input output pins. Uh, this is a pin that some of them have special powers. Uh, a couple of them are serial console pins. Uh, some of them are uh, pulse width modulation pins. Uh, some of them are power pins. All of these are software customizable. So you can go into Linux and say, this pin is now this, this pin is now that. Leave the power pins alone. Nobody wants that surprise when you've converted it into a general purpose pin and you don't know why you're not getting five volts out of it. Um, uh, you can put data in, you can send data out. Um, there are, uh, there is one five volt pin, uh, most of them are 3.3, .3. all of the general purpose I.O. pins are expecting 3.3 .3 volts across them and not five volt, so don't program any Arduino projects that are expecting five volts across the pins because the Pi will then again emit the magic smoke. Um, there is no voltage protection coming back in. You can run your power across the GPIO, and there's lots of people that have discussed doing this. I don't recommend it because the mini, uh, the micro USB port that the power normally comes in has voltage protection to try and prevent, you know, crazy scenarios from, you know, emitting the magic smoke. Uh, the GPIO has no so, such protection. So, but. It's also important to remember that when they re revised the Raspberry Pi to update and add more memory, they went ahead and renumbered all the pins again. So there's two numberings of pins that are out there, the old and the new. And uh, so uh, I think our favorite hack is really the one that helps you understand what pin is what number. Yeah, because these handy dandy teeny tiny pins, they are not labeled for your convenience. So this guy, uh, you may be interested in him, his name is Dr. Simon Monk. And not only did he make a Raspberry Pi cluster, but he made this. Yes which it, he calls it the Raspberry Leap. And it, you print it out on a piece of paper, you lay it over there, and now you have GPIO labels. It's super handy. And you can even, uh, Adafruit now sells the uh, little metal ones that you can lie on there so that it's more permanent. Best project ever. Now, let's say that you want to run something on the Pi. And the good news is, is that at this point, the distributions that are out there for the Raspberry Pi have a lot of the software that you probably want to run already pre-compiled, pre-optimized for the Raspberry Pi. But let's just say that you have something new. You can compile your thing on the Pi, and then you can go to war and come back, and it might be done. Um, it's going to take a while. The bigger the code, the longer it's going to take. The Pi is not a speed demon by any means, and you really see how slow it is when you go to compile things on it. Um, so you want to compile a kernel, don't do it on the Pi. Build a cross-compiler. Um, cross-compiling used to be sort of a black art where you would have to get a virgin, a bucket full of frogs, and the right moon, and uh, have it all come together perfectly so that you could, you know, get a cross-compiler that actually worked. Um, but I don't have to do that anymore? You've got to send back the frogs. Uh, yeah, well, the, the, the virgin ran away. So um, uh, CrossToolNG is now available uh, for you to have this all simplified. So CrossToolNG is basically a front end. It looks very much like the NCURSE's front end to building the Linux kernel itself. And it walks you through the options. You tell it what optimizations you want, what kind of target you're building for, what languages you want to build support for, what additional libraries you want to build to add on to the environment. And then you can uh, hit enter on that and it will go through and pull down the sources and build everything the way that you want it. Uh, we actually have a whole chapter in the book that talks about how to build a cross compiler that's perfectly optimized for the Raspberry Pi environment. So now that we've told you uh, how to do things you're going to do, <coughs> let's look at the things that other people built that are super fun. Most of them involve a case and that is a really great first project because uh, as someone who has a lot of naked pies floating around the house, 
it feels worse than a Lego when you step on those GPIO pens. <laughs> Cases are good. So you have a lot of options. You can make one out of all sorts of materials. You can 3D print one, which is probably the best cases that we have had are the ones that came off of the 3D printer. And then you can even make it look whatever you like, whatever you want it to look like. Uh, you can buy one. There are lots of cases out there. Some of them are really, really bad. We bought some, I think, off of Adafruit. So if you find one that's a black bottom and a clear lid, it breaks when you try to put things together. It breaks off these pieces that hold the SD card in, which is a terrible feature in a case. And so then you end up super gluing SD cards into your pie, and that's a problem. Then you end up super glued to a pie, and it's awkward. <laughs> or, so one time a guy, uh, I said this, and a guy raised his hand, and he said, I have the best case, and he holds it up, and he had the cardboard box that it comes in, and he'd exacto it out around all of the ports. <laughs> like, all right, well, that was the easiest case to make, but my favorites are made out of Legos, because I like Legos. Uh, there are lots of great TARDIS cases. This is one. Uh, if, if you just Google Lego Raspberry Pi case, you're going to be in the rabbit hole all the way through lunch. It's super fun. There's another one. <laughs> I like this one. This guy says that he, he notes in his photos that the Raspberry Pi command center is fully OSHA ISO 9001, ASME, IEEE, and Sarbanes-Oxley compliant. <laughs> There is also a kit to build this particular Lego case. And uh, I could give you the whole dissertation, and we'll be happy to later at the Fedora booth, about the appropriate price per brick that you should be paying for Legos. This does not have an appropriate price per brick ratio. Also, you have to order it from the UK, and so your shipping's going to be insane. <laughs> you can build with Legos. The only good feature here is you get the little round thing and the two little green bits, and you get a leaf. But you can get that out of the Lego store. They have all the bins. That's what it's there for. Steal your kids' Legos. It's great. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, whatever. <laughs> he said it was designed by a Girl Scout, sure. All right, great, Girl Scouts are great. Uh, as many of you said, the first thing that you did was turn it into a little HTPC, put XVMC on there, that's what RASVMC does. Literally, all you have to do is flash the card with RASVMC, plug it in, and do a little bit of setup. It's super duper easy, and then you have a Raspberry Pi project, and you get to sit back and watch TV, and it took you about 10 minutes. If you do this um, and you think, hey, there's a USB port coming off the back of my TV and you have weird behavior issues, remember what I said about power? <laughs> just, just be aware. Uh, my seven-year-old set it up. It's that easy. But I love this guy. This is one of the comments on the RASBMC page. It basically says, I Googled some stuff. I don't know what I'm doing, but now I'm watching TV. Yay! <laughs> Uh, this is learn from my error sort of lessons, but it is also a lesson in how the pie is pretty resilient and will do some of the stupid things that you suggest that it may do. <laughs> so we got together when we first got a bunch of our Raspberry Pis and started thinking, what should we build? And we bought a bunch of crap online and we bought a bunch of crap at Radio Shack and we just started plugging things together. And I'm like, all right, I'm gonna take apart an old Game Boy and I'm gonna shove a pie in there with a tiny screen and I'm gonna have a little Raspberry Pi Game Boy. And actually, just about a week or two ago, there was a project going around online where someone had had a much more successful endpoint with this than I did. So my biggest problem in, in fitting it all in there is that giant RCA connector um, that is in the way of your case. The, the Game Boy case is about that big, and that connector comes out like that far. So it's a fixable <laughs> problem, but I'm too lazy to fix it. The point of this story is, we got this set up in the floor of the office. You can see our lovely office carpet at the top of it. And, um, this is not how you should connect things to the GPIO, but I was incredibly impatient, and I had no connectors, but I had teeny tiny alligator clips. We have no time for soldering. <laughs> and so the picture that I really wish I had is me looking directly down on the top of the pie, making sure that the teeny tiny alligator clips are not touching anything else. Also, at the time, so this is a little two and a half inch TFT screen that we bought off of Adafruit. And at the time, there was no documentation with it. There was not even a data sheet. There was absolutely nothing. It was just like, here you go, have a teeny tiny monitor. Now there is, and that monitor requires 12 volts of power, which, as you can see, is not happening in any fashion, but I played Tetris for a really long time. Yeah, it, it appears to be really tolerant of 5 volts. <laughs> but if you add a, so I call this my Pi Boy, if you add a P, you get a Pip Boy, and this is uh, another guy's project. He saw the Raspberry Pi and saw a Halloween costume, which I did too, except he wanted to put it on his arm. And so he built the Pit Boy from Fallout, used um, some version of, of Polymorph to make the casing around it, except it all shorted out about an hour before the party, so he walked around with a dead Pit Boy on his arm. But he has a great blog about it. If you just Google Raspberry Pi Pit Boy, you can read all about the build. And I think he's, he's still rebuilding it for like two years. 
So I'm a gamer, and uh, one of the things I wanted to do with the Pi was to uh, was to emulate video games across it. Um, to preempt the inevitable question, yes, it does play Minecraft. No, I don't care. Um, but uh, the uh, the Pi is capable of emulating pretty much up to a PlayStation One uh, with some degree of success. And so Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, uh, Genesis, Atari, all of these games, even the MAME stack will uh, run on the Raspberry Pi. And in fact, the MAME emulator is what we have uh, on the costume so that people could walk up and play uh, old school arcade games on Soundwave. We felt that was more fitting than running PlayStation One games on Soundwave. If, uh, if you're playing in advanced mode, I start running back and forth while you attempt to play Frogger. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do to kids who decide to punch the robot. Yeah. But uh, it's shown here playing Super Metroid, and again, any of the games in that family are uh, going to run really well in the Pi. The emulator is already well optimized for it. You don't have to do any of the work. Most of it is just going out, downloading the emulator, putting it in play. Uh, there's a couple different sites out there for pre-built projects that will suck in all the known emulators, put it all into a nice menu structure for you, and then you just have to feed it ROMs. I don't know where you would get ROMs. It's not like you can't Google that, um, so don't ask. If you like your games itty bitty, this is an option. That's a cigarette lighter for scale because they had not yet invented bananas for scale. Uh, what I love about this project, other than the fact that it is itty bitty and I might not have good enough vision to play on a screen that tiny, is that uh, on spritesmods.com you can see all of the directions for building this yourself. They look like this. <laughs> <laughs> Which is everything you need to know, but I love that he's just like, you know what, I'm going to scribble on the back of a napkin, I'm going to scan it in, you want to build it, it's on you, buddy. Adafruit also now sells this, they call it the Cupcade, which is a $120 kit, I think, to uh, effectively do the same thing, but you already have the little cabinet made and the buttons and everything, you don't have to hunt it all down and put it together. So. The, the Cupcade is actually slightly bigger. The, uh, yeah. the Sprites mod, he actually had to cut the pie in half to get it to fit in that size the format. The Cupcade is probably about the size of this cup. Yeah, so. Yeah, um, but yeah, you, so you just have to go and find your ROMs and all of that, which is easy enough. I think it's actually the same size screen we were showing off for the... No, no, the Cupcade is smaller. Is it? The, the two and a half inch. It's, I don't know, maybe we're like a one and a half inch diagonal? Yeah, it's a, it's a TFT. It's not a... We've only seen one in person once because somebody brought it to our talk and probably played games instead of hanging out with us. Yeah, he, be <laughs> he begged me for ROMs for like 20 minutes, so... This is my favorite version. Uh, so we were in what we call the best bar in the world. It's this bar in Paris that's totally geek themed. There's Millennium Falcon on the wall. You haven't heard that whole story. It also is available at the Fedora booth later uh, or anywhere you find me. But they had these. I call it the Pizza Hut table because that's where I remember seeing them when I was a kid. It's the, the table, the co like coffee table and has the games and it flips back and forth to player one, player two. And this was the moment I realized that every good idea I have, somebody has already built it because if you just, apparently everybody else calls it the Pizza Hut table too because that's what I Google first, Raspberry Pi Pizza Hut gaming table. And there are a bunch of them. This is one of them that's on Instructables. I like them. Oh, Ikea and a pie, and you're good to go. Oh, so uh, the, the second part of the everything I, I can think of has already been made. Uh, came, it, we work at Red Hat, and we have several mailing lists. There's an all-company mailing list, and then local ones for each office. And a friend emailed our local office mailing list and said, hey, wondering if anybody has a Geiger counter I could borrow for the weekend. <laughs> that was the whole message. And so I messaged him on IRC and said, what you doing? <laughs> and he said, he did not say what he was doing. He said, great, could you build me a Raspberry Pi Geiger counter? <laughs> Apparently I could. <laughs> if I wanted to. Yeah, the backstory behind why there is a Raspberry Pi Geiger counter is actually kind of interesting. Uh, Fukushima, Japan, uh, the government was telling the locals that live nearby that there was nothing to worry about, and one of the local hackers of the nearby makerspace was like, I do not trust you. I do not believe you. And so he got a Raspberry Pi, and he built himself a Geiger counter out of it and posted the parts online and encouraged everyone around him to build them and hand them out to the locals so that they could actually know what the radiation level was near their house. Yeah, the, if, if you would like to know why he was looking for a Geiger counter, his uncle had brought him a railroad spike from Hiroshima, and he wanted to know what was coming off of it. <laughs> <laughs> if you actually do decide that you'd like to use the Raspberry Pi for an educational purpose for, say, a child instead of building robot costumes, which is an entirely valid choice, uh, there is a fantastic book I love called Super Scratch Programming Adventure. And uh, it, obviously you can use it with Scratch on your larger Linux machine, but most of the Raspberry Pi distros come with Scratch already installed. Uh, my kid kind of freaks out now if she finds a computer that doesn't already have Scratch on it. 
So the way this book is designed is a comic book on the left. And if you're not familiar with Scratch, the little cat up there is the mascot of Scratch. And so he's what you see. You can make the cat walk, dance, talk, spin in circles, whatever. And so you have this comic book, and the cat is in peril. Something happens to the cat. And then on the right, you have all the steps to go through in Scratch to solve it. And what Scratch does for you is make the bits of code into puzzle pieces. And so when you put the puzzle pieces together, your code works. And at the end of the book, you have a video game that you built and you get to play. And that's really satisfying as a kid. Like, I didn't just go through this book and learn some crap, and now I have to figure out what to do with it. I actually have something that I can do. This is another uh, good educational tool. It's called Google Coder. It was a Google Labs project. And so you install Google Coder on the Pi, and then you access it from your laptop or whatever with Chrome. And this is what you see. And so Gadgetoid is sort of like an Asteroids game. Eyeball is a pair of eyeballs that follow your mouse around the screen. Uh, Hello Coder, I don't remember. It does much of nothing. And the plus mark is where you get to start on your own. And so it helps you learn uh, HTML, Node.js, CSS, and uh, some basic JavaScript, I think. And so you have options. You can. This is the Gadgetoid, the Asteroids game. This is the basic editing. And so you just go edit. Maybe I want size five rocks instead of size two rocks and things like that. And you see how editing those variables changes the result. And then you can go in and you can actually edit all the code directly. So this is what you get if you just want to start from scratch. And you write it and then you see it on the right and, and you get to play with the ones that they've built and then figure it out on your own, which is kind of fun. And this is, uh, this is just a great example of, of people using these out in the wild. This is a solar powered Raspberry Pi lab at a school in Ghana. They don't have power, but they have sun. They have lots and lots of sun. And, uh, and so there's a uh, an organization called Power and Potential that's working on putting these in a bunch of other schools. Uh, they're, uh, they started with three schools uh, total, and now they're going to do three schools in each of the 30 regions in Tanzania. better have stored up a lot of solar power first. But if you happen to live in, in Ghana or Tanzania, less of a problem. Lots more sun and way less rain. In less educational pursuits, perhaps uh, you wanted the costume instead of teaching your child something. And so this guy decided to uh, build himself a fun little, he calls it the Pylorian. Oh, we're not getting the sound out, but you can see what it, yep, got the whole flex capacitor, got the whole thing going. I do not think that it actually results in time travel, but I can't swear. What year is this? <laughs> I don't, that guy doesn't look like you at all. You're doing a really good job with the costumes. What kind of power supply do I need for 1.21 gigawatts? <laughs> Lightning. Well, if you're wearing to, willing to wear a little necklace of uranium. Or, or Mr. Fusion. <laughs> Uh, there are also lots of home automation projects, turning on and off your lights and doing things like the AT&T commercial with the people on the front porch who are like, my stupid kids didn't turn off the lights. But I like this one because they put a uh, Star Trek L card yes. in the <laughs> I'm like, if I'm going to automate my house, I might as well be living in the 24th century, right? <laughs> this guy... <laughs> has not yet completed his project. I've been, talking about this. <laughs> I've been talking about this for like two years. So his problem is he knew how to build the chevrons and all and has this, he has a life-size Stargate, uh, or as he refers to it, functioning Stargate. And I think the finger quotes have never been more appropriate than in the phrase functioning Stargate. <laughs> but he wanted to use Raspberry Pis to make the lights and the sounds and all of that and perhaps the functioning part. Uh, but he doesn't know anything about a Pi or programming or how to get started. So if you are willing to be the final piece in the functioning Stargate puzzle, Stargate project, he has all this funding, all these companies funding him. I'm like, how can you not find somebody just to make some lights blink? This can't be that hard. He's uh, also looking for weapons grade in Akrata, so if you have any of that. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you are previously an Arduino person looking to adventure into the pie and you're like, I got this desk drawer full of Arduino shields, there is a, not app, there's a piece of hardware for that. Uh, this is called the Alamo for your pie. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. There are a couple of less cleverly named ones, things like Arduino for your pie, but the end result is the same. It lies on top and then you add your Arduino shield and that is what it was designed to do. Oh, this is uh, <clears throat> my favorite project. I don't 
start my coffee maker. The coffee machine is making a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> the next step I feel they're missing is somehow the Raspberry Pi is going to pick up the coffee and bring it to me because I'm not sure what the point of starting it remotely is if I still have to get it to I, I offered to build a trebuchet for it, but she was not interested. <laughs> I think we're on to something here. You know, I'm gonna finish I'm gonna finish my functioning TARDIS before I finish a Stargate. I feel like I'm gonna go walk around it. Uh, this is a project that I entirely intended to bring, and then uh, my husband and I drove separately and he left in our house, so you can yell at him later. But uh, Rodney should wave his hand because he actually built it back in the back corner. But uh, <laughs> he's like, who me? What? I'm not here. <laughs> But if you have neighbors or have seen online people with the super cool Christmas lights displays that you know play Wizards of Winter and then go all crazy, you can run four strands of lights off of this. You just need a lot more relays if you would like to have an epic Wizards of Winter. Or the one that, that did the, what does the fox say with all the pumpkins going, if you saw that video. Uh, there's also a project called PiFM that I don't think I have in the slides anymore, but PiFM is a project where you turn your Pi into an FM radio. And with um, FM transmitter to be clear. FM transmitter, sorry. What did I say? Radio. Radio. I'm gonna stop saying words too. So, <laughs> with a um, questionably legal 50 centimeter piece of wire attached to the GPIO, it will <laughs> transmit <laughs> at least far enough for the people driving by your house to hear what you're sending out. And so, Pi FM. Do on Christmas lights. You are the most annoying neighbor on the block. <laughs> <laughs> Do not, do not wire this into your cell phone tower, please. <laughs> uh, this is the best Valentine ever. It is a life-size, reasonably functioning R2 unit. It is bilingual in Japanese and English. It records messages and plays them back for you. It walks, talks, dances, I don't know. It does everything. And uh, I think that it's the best Valentine ever because he made it for his girlfriend and now she's his wife. So clearly R2 was a success. This is one of those more practical projects. Uh, their goal is to result in an uh, obviously unmanned autonomous uh, little boat to go across the ocean and collect uh, sea data. My favorite part is their waterproof housing, <laughs> <laughs> which I believe is traditionally referred to as Tupperware. <laughs> but, but real serious hackers don't, don't even need Tupperware. That's you right, because my friend Tom just drops his Raspberry Pi in a bucket of water. <laughs> Yeah, so to be fair, that's not an untreated Raspberry Pi in a bucket of water with a terrible, terrible cell phone camera video. I apologize so many times. Uh, but rather, this is uh, a Raspberry Pi that's been coated with a paint called Never Wet that you can buy from Home Depot. Uh, Rust-Oleum sells it, and you basically you paint this uh, pie up with your Never Wet. You put your two coats of the different kind of paint on it, and then you can submerse it completely in water, and it will run happily. Now. On the website, it says things like, you know, in the FAQ question one, can I do this to electronics? And it says no. It lies. Well, it also, it, it does tell you that it only lasts a certain unknown amount of time. So what we have not tested is how long it would take for this to no longer function. And so if you would like to send your boat across the ocean, you should probably stick with the Tupperware. I ran it for 20 minutes with no ill effect, but. 20 minutes? I have never built a project needed to last more than 20 minutes. I know, right? Man. Cameras are super duper handy, and as Tom mentioned, for a long time, there was this little black bar on the Pi that did absolutely nothing except take up space. But then they decided to make an itty bitty camera to go into the little connector. And uh, so you saw it functioning. Whoa! Sorry. She's escaped. <laughs> I'm just going to yank it out of here and make the Pi really angry. Uh, so you saw it functioning on the screen there. That's how big it is. That's the whole camera. Uh, it does video as well, and the, this is a really great project for kids to start with because the scripts to make all of this happen are basically a line, and you can control so many things. This version is the Pi Noir, no IR, the infrared version, and it comes with a little blue filter. And so uh, this is a project called Infogram. They're actually using not infrared, but infra blue because the result is it tells them lots of interesting things about the photosynthesis happening in an area. And so this is a picture of obviously the same place, taken with the infrared blue and then with a regular camera. And so they're using it to survey sections of land to find out about the health of the region using the little pie cameras. 
And this is another Rodney project, and he's not going to wave anymore this time than he did last time, but the guy in the back corner there, this is his picture from a uh, low Earth orbit uh, photography rig in a super cool housing called a styrofoam cooler, uh, <laughs> which, part of which helps it keep within the FAA regulations. But then the result is you get cool pictures like this, or you can send you know, Lego minifigs up there and take pictures of them hanging out way higher than you ever get to fly. Stupid minifigs getting to fly up into space. But the results are really awesome. And we have lots more ideas. We could tell you about Pi projects all day, but we'll uh, shoot you some resources and take your questions. Two questions. One, has the reason for SD card corruption when you overclock the Pi been resolved, or is it just kind of a mystery of why sometimes it happens and why it doesn't? Well, I think the, it's not much of a mystery. You're overclocking the Pi. Um, uh, to be frank, uh, when, you, when you overclock any chip beyond what it's rated for, you're going to get weird operations out of uh, the GPU, and the firmware is actually running across the GPU on the Raspberry Pi. So you're, you're heating up the temperature of the thing that is controlling the firmware, which is writing out to the disk. So it is entirely unsurprising that the SD card would then write garbage at random as a result, uh, which is why you know I only overclock in cases where I don't really plan on using that project for long periods of time. Um, and there's a little bit of tolerance, uh, and in fact, the most recent versions of the firmware I will overclock within the safe ranges automatically. So really think hard before you overclock outside of the dynamic ranging that it's doing by default. Question two? The second question was, how come there isn't more of an emphasis on being able to move the Raspberry Pi, ramp off the SD card, and actually have your data off of a USB for higher disk I.O.? Well, so it's a USB 2.0 port. It's a low power USB 2.0 port. So your performance isn't going to be that much better than it would be across the SD card. Um, it's minusculely better. I mean, if you're doing micro benchmarks, you're going to see a slight performance improvement across USB 2.0, but you're not going to get USB 3.0 speeds. You're not going to get anything like that. Honestly, if you want the fastest throughput, you're going to want to go over network mount. That's going to be your fastest throughput as opposed to going over USB. So doing a network mount across a good connection because you've got the 100 megabit uh, connection, if you can saturate that, you're going to get much better than you would get if you were directly connecting any sort of storage. No. You can float some Pixies by them wearing boots. There are people who have, done, who have done some really elaborate hacks to enable Pixie booting. Basically, they've written uh, a custom OS that does nothing but tell the, uh, that boots the kernel in a minimum state to tell it to listen to Pixie boot on something. And so you then you're chain booting off of that. But if you're at that point, just run off the SD card. I mean, come on. I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Uh, go to elinux.org and it has that. So I have an assortment of Pydora shirts, and it looks like large, extra large, and 2X. If those of you asking questions would like to take a shirt, color your size and I'll trade one. 2X. 2X. <laughs> All right, well, you two got the 2X. Large. 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 XL. <laughs> Who's the other person who asked the question? Not here. I'll give you the rest of them out. Any other questions? The people who don't want shirts, questions? Yes. So no. Um, the, the biggest problem with doing a real-time operating on the Pi is that it has no real-time clock. <laughs> there is no RTC on the Pi, so you're not going to get real-time operations. Now, there are a lot of uh, add-on devices to add RTCs, and there's a lot of uh, projects online that talk about how to add the RTC chip to uh, the Pi, either in your existing circuit board to do something else. Uh, a lot of the things like the Allo mode and other devices that actually layer onto the GPIO will add the RTC in so that you can get that RTC. But if you're looking for pure real-time operations, you're going to want to go to a, a more dedicated embedded board that has that set up already pre-configured. The Pi is not a good fit for that. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of add-on boards that do exactly that. That will, uh, They'll layer in, they'll jump into the Pi across the GPIO pins. Um, they'll usually have a custom image that you run to take advantage of the extra features. Um, they'll usually bring in external power at a higher rate. You'll see there are boards that are out there for robotics use on the Pi that add relay switches and stepper motor controls and things like that. Depending on the project you're looking for, there's a lot of people that are selling custom add-on boards that will extend the Pi out to do additional things. 
Now, if you're really, really wanting to go in a specific area, you might want to research whether a Pi would be a better fit versus an Arduino setup for the project that you're looking at. But there's a lot of people that are using it uh, exactly the way you're describing it. They wanted to get uh, a higher voltage of power into the mix or expand out to a set of uh, additional GPIO pins, uh, add real-time support to the board, add motor control, all sorts of things like that. Well, and depending on what you want to build, the Pi might not be the right board. There are 400 other similar things. The Pi just happens to be cheap and has a cool name, but there are lots of others. It is not a super awesome computer from 2014. It is a super awesome computer from 1997. <laughs> <laughs> if, you know, it was designed for a purpose, and that was to teach young, like, say, middle to college age students what a piece of hardware looks like and how to do some basic programming. It wasn't designed for all the stuff that we're doing with it anyway because it's cool. Yeah. But there are other projects, other boards that are designed for that. Everybody, I feel comfortable saying this, everybody in this room has a phone that's faster than the Raspberry Pi. Way, so much faster. And if you're not convinced, go back and put Android on it. <laughs> and, and move your mouse and then see how long it takes the mouse to go across the screen. Any more questions? So uh, that is where you can find the slides. And the QR code takes you to the book if you really want the book. I have one to give away, and I haven't figured out how to give it away. Give me a good trivia question. Um, what genre? Star Trek. Star Trek. Because it will help you enjoy the book more if you find our this is, this, is, this is easy. Uh, what was the scenario that uh, Kirk cheated at in the Academy? And uh, what was what was? Too easy? It's a little too easy. Too Here, easy. All right, wait, wait. I have a whole trivia file. Let's work on this. Mm -hmm. Give away t-shirt. Everybody should know that one. The value of the Okay, we'll give away a shirt for my easy trivia question. Who has the answer to that? I'm going to give a shirt to everybody in the room. <laughs> there you go. We, uh, the first time I, I gave something away, I said uh, for whoever could name pi to the most digits, and this guy just kept going and going, and I gave up because nobody's ever going to be better than that. We, we weren't even sure if he was right. We were just like, okay, here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's a good question. According to DC Comics editor Paul Kupperberg, supported by license plates in Superman Returns, Metropolis is not based on New York City, but is in fact located in what state? Nope. Nope, although that would be a logical answer. <laughs> Apparently it's in Delaware. All right, uh, name one of two books that starts with It Was a Dark and Stormy Night. Kobayashi Maru is not the answer. <laughs> <laughs> For about five minutes. <laughs> Not very successful one. Thank you. Any more questions? All right, the rest of you can come get one of the t-shirts. Yeah, come, come fight for shirts and our amusement. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling.
Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.